the book of Job is kind of a, a, a complex book, somebody might say, and it is. So I'm not really taking this topic with easiness. But you remember that we already analyzed some wonderful Old Testament uh, personalities, such as Samson, such as Gideon. And we need to understand, we need to know the story and the lessons from the Old Testament brethren. And therefore, Job is one of those outstanding characters. Um, there are historical research that says that he might have been one of the Kelps, one of the um, Egyptian uh, pharaohs. I don't know how much is that true or not, but there was, there was this tradition. Nevertheless, it's a book which seems to have many views and many interpretations with regards to what the meaning and the purpose of that book really is. Now, while there are numerous interpretations, there are two major prevailing perspectives on the book of Job. The first perspective is that of suffering, obviously, because the first association, association, I guess, that all of you feel when we say Job, you get all of the ideas of tremendous suffering of that person. Now, the book is often viewed as a book on suffering, and it can be explained as an attempt to explain why good people suffer, how to endure suffering, a book explaining that the followers of Christ will suffer, etc., etc. The second general perspective, the one that used to be prevalent in the Church of God, and I think even to this day, it is uh, it is the prevalent perspective. Uh, the general second perspective is that of a condemnation of an individual who is being self-righteous. Now, over time, that perspective has received uh, a lot of focus and attention in the Church of God. And I think often when we discussed about Job, the, 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 the prevalent uh, conclusion was it was, you know, it all happened to him so that it would correct his view of himself view of his self-righteousness. Now, over the time, so again, that perspective became like dominant. Well, after all, in the book of Job, brethren, uh, Job holds to the fact that he has done nothing wrong, seemingly until the very end. All the while, while he's holding to his belief that he has done nothing wrong, throughout the book, his friends chide him in an effort to help him see the error of his ways and to understand that he has been self righteous now it is important you know that i just mentioned these two prevalent perspectives briefly because they are like the groundwork now before we get to the heart of the matter and before we understand what's really going on in the book uh because there is yes indeed we can we can see what is going on in the book and uh, have a perspective that we need to have so uh, therefore let's now continue with I've, uh, I've divided this book into three sections for our easier understanding, but we can get into that in a minute. Uh, what is important to know that, you know, uh, as we consider those these two perspectives, there is one theme that we should understand, and that theme, brethren, is that God is seen as a cruel, 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 cruel God, you know. Um, here is a Job, here is poor Job, you know, who by all accounts tries to do what is right, as he comprehends what is right and wrong, yet he gets punished for uh, he gets punished severely for trying to do what is right, and that frame that frames the view that many hold of the God of the Old Testament today, brethren, is the cruel God of the Old Testament contrasted frequently with the loving, kind, gentle Jesus Christ in the New Testament. But this view of God is not something new. We will see this view even among Job's friends, my dear brethren. But now back to the two main perspectives of the book. So the concept of suffering and self-righteousness. Job's trials are often viewed as an example of enduring suffering at the hands of a difficult, inflexible and sometimes demanding God. The goal, as this perspective would encourage, is to learn to endure incredible suffering, all the while knowing that God is allowing the suffering so that Job can learn to endure. Other view of the book, other view of the book as a way of explaining why good people suffer. You know, when we evaluated the book of Job from a perspective of trying to understanding suffering, the book is quiet. The book is quiet. It doesn't have a lot to say on the reasons why. There are principles we can take away from the book of Job with regard to suffering, but book, the book simply does not answer many of the questions we have with regard to why. Why have, su why have suffering in this life? 
Now, brethren, we all will experience suffering in this life to, you know, a great to one degree or another. James, the Apostle James shows in uh, James chapter 1, James chapter 1, verse 2, 3 and 4, James explains that we will encounter the fiery trials and that we should rejoice in the trials because they help us mature and become more perfect. However, the, tr the thrust of the book of Job is not focused on the purpose of suffering or enduring suffering. As a matter of fact, most of Job's time in the book is engaged in trying to understand why he is suffering. Now, another popularly held belief, and one that has been frequently considered in the church, is that Job is a book about self-righteousness, you know. Or, to put it another way, it is a book about a self-righteous man that is brought to a position through his trials that he understands how self-righteous he actually is. Now, many see the book as a warning against self-righteousness. Brethren, to be careful of that trap that Job fell into, uh, that is feeling that his righteousness, or what he did, rivaled that of the Eternals. Now, this is probably one of the most broadly held perspectives of the book, not only in the church, but probably beyond the church. Now, again, this perspective also fits with the underlying theme of a harsh God. Better if Job was self-righteous, at least to the degree his friends claimed he was, then God had to address his self-righteousness aggressively. So that is at least one of the concepts that we see. Now, there are several places in the book that could lead us to the conclusion that he was self-righteous. Uh, in Job chapter 15, now consider Eliphaz's comments in Job 15, verse 5. Job 15, verse 5. For your iniquity, says Eliphaz, for your iniquity teaches your mouth, and you choose the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you, and are not I. Yes, your own lips testify against you. Well, brethren, why would his lips testify against him? Well, because from Eliphaz's perception, Job is self-righteous. Because if you notice, you know, notice now verse 7, that this is Eliphaz's percep uh, perception. Verse 7, Are you the first man who was born, or were you made before the hills? Have you heard the counsel of God? Do you limit wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we do not know? What do you understand that is not in us? Both the gray-haired and the aged are among us, much older than your father. Are you consolations of God, too small for you, and the words spoken gently with you? Now, Eliphaz is obviously frustrated that Job would not listen and agree with what he and his friends were saying. But the contrast is also with the eternal. You see, Eliphaz has the perspective that Job is so angry and so convinced of his righteousness that he ignores the comforts of God and the wisdom they have conveyed to God. The operative phrase here is the wisdom they have conveyed for God. Now, when you look at, when you look into the words Eliphaz uses, he's telling Job, we are giving you wisdom that has come from God. So when you look at this, Eliphaz has painted a picture of a standard that he believes or that he has applied to Job. And he is frustrated that Job won't listen to him. Now please also consider chapter 27 in the book of Job. Now remember we are talking about the perspective that Job was self-righteous. Job chapter 27 verse 4. My lips will not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. When you read in verse 4. Now at first glance... We can look at that and say, wow, Job is, really was self-righteous. But Job had been very careful to keep the letter of the law, at least as far as he understood it. And when we read, when we read chapters 1 and 2 of Job, which we will, we see that even the Eternal recognized Job's effort and his desire to keep the law. In Job 27 verse 5, now says, Far be from me that I should say you are right referring again to Bildad, Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me, verse 6, my righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. Now the point Job, Job is making is that he will continue to do all that he knows to do. So the two major perspectives on the Job, on the book of Job, are that it is possibly an example of a 
of enduring trials and suffering, or a warning of self-righteousness. Yet neither of those perspectives is accurate, brethren. It's not an accurate view of the purpose of the book, because neither of those perspectives actually describes what God is doing in Job's life. So what is the purpose or intent of the book, you might say? Well, one of the important aspects of understanding the book of Job is understanding the overall structure of the book. Because often when we read the Bible, it's easy to get into a habit of reading it from a linear perspective. What does that mean? Because you see our system of education worldwide, stemming from a Greek-based education, encourages us to approach information from a linear or logical process where one step leads logically to another, then the next, then the next, etc. And you have to go through those steps in order. But what does not generally happen in Greek logic is moving from step one to step three, and then from step three to step seven, and then go from step seven down to step two. Now you guess, is that the logic that happens in the Bible? Yes, indeed, because you might have heard that the Bible is written in with a Hebrew thought process and in a Hebrew kind of uh, mentality, Hebrew way. And here in the book of Job, we do have, you see, a good example of that. Because uh, the challenge with the book of Job in particular is the Hebrew thought process, which is not linear. Probably one of the easiest ways to describe the Hebrew thought process is what you could call block logic. Block logic is different because uh, there you have the concepts that are expressed in self-contained units or blocks of thought. The blocks do not necessarily fit together in an obvious linear or logical pattern, at least from our human perspective. The challenge with this way of thinking is that it creates a propensity for paradox or apparent contradiction, especially if you're approaching it from a linear thought process. From a Hebrew perspective, brethren, at times it is okay to start with step one, move to step three, come back to step two, and try, then try to make sense of an overall concept or idea. But that goes against the Greek linear thought process, and this type of block logic is the basis uh, of uh, what we find in both uh, well, what we find in the scriptures anyway, please let's consider Matthew 10. You're going to see it now. Those block, uh, 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 block logic, or if you want to see block thought process. Matthew 10, verse 39, the words of Jesus Christ. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So you have the two... Two blocks of thought here in this scripture, brethren. The first block is if you find your life, you lose it. The second is you lose your life, you'll find it. Now the first seemingly stands in contrast to the second. However, as we understand having the Spirit of God to guide us, we have to give up this life, pictured through baptism and take up the cross, mentioned a few chapters earlier, and mature into a new creation. That is when we start on the road to true life. Now we see that these two seemingly conflicting ideas fit seamlessly together. They fit perfectly together. But from a linear point of view, from a linear logical thought process, these two thoughts actually stand in contrast to each other and cannot be evaluated from a linear perspective. All right, now turning our attention, attention back to the book of Job, if we read the book of Job from a linear perspective, from this linear logical perspective, we will miss much of the intent and meaning of the book. So how do we think about Job? How do we look at the structure in the book of Job? Well, for our purposes, this afternoon, brethren, I thought that we should break the book of Job into three major blocks. And of all those three, I'll just cover only one. And the other two, we will just leave for the coming Sabbaths. Uh, because the book itself is already complex enough and uh, yeah, to tackle it, it's not really an easy task. And to be honest with you, I've been for quite some time trying to avoid <laughs> tackling the book of Job, thinking, oh my, how in the world am I going to wrestle with all these Hebrew thought processes, with block thoughts, with uh, how am I going to explain it well to you? Well, however, nevertheless, we have to, <laughs> one of these days, Sooner or later, we will have to tackle the book of Job. So I said to myself, let's not, putting off, let's not put it off anymore. 
let's just, you know, let's just delve into the book of Job. And uh, we'll probably have to come back to the book of Job at another time. And uh, we'll have to come back again to analyzing that because, well, that's what the word of God is always. You always like that. You keep analyzing that. Sometimes you find always something new. Sometimes you wonder, my word, this is so enlightening. How come I didn't see this before? And that's what uh, makes the, book, the, the, the Word of God different from other books. You know, it's not like a novel that you can read once and leave it aside, or a movie you can just watch once and see all the main characters and what is the plot and so on, and just leave it for, you know, for whatever. No, it is, uh, no, it is the Word of God, which is it's constantly, you know, always, you always find something new. You always, you always discover on earth some other nudges of wisdom, some other truth, or perhaps even revelation, you might say. You know, some people get uh, new revelation as they read uh, things that I've read so many times. And therefore, uh, that's what makes the book of God, uh, the, the word of God that is different from, different from all the other books in the world. It's not an ordinary book. And let the whole thing be even more interesting. All those books, uh, all those books are, of course, connected by, by the same inspiration. But all those books also are kind of, uh, uh, kind of written in, in uh, it's not always so obvious. So it's in, uh, like in, in, in written in, in codes. So you need to decode it. And the main thing, the, the main one of the main one of the main keys of decoding the book of God, the work of God, the word of God, is to understand the identity of Israel. Because once you understand the identity of Israel, then all of these various uh, prophecies in the Bible, and it's one third of the Bible, by the way, or approximately one third, all of those prophecies, all that one third of the Bible, suddenly makes perfect sense. You see, so. Uh, Turning our attention back to Job, if we read the book of Job from a linear perspective, uh, we'll miss so much. And as I said, I have uh, made like three major blocks, three major logical units or sections of scripture. Section one will be chapter one, two, and three. So chapter one, two, one, two and three, it will be the eternal view of Job and Satan's attacks. Section two will be chapter four through chapter 37. Uh, in those chapters, we'll find the immature minds attempt to understand Elohim and their ways, their way of life. And section 3, finally, will be chapter 38 to 42. It's about Job's reconciliation with the Eternal, with Elohim, and repentance of Job. And when we read and study Job, we should almost think of chapters 4 through 37 as an inset between the periods when the Eternal is actually working with Job. When we look at chapters 4 through 37, the eternal is virtually non-existent in those chapters, brethren. Job and his friends will refer to eternal frequently, but we don't actually see the eternal interacting with those people. So from Job's perspective, we could more accurately refer to him as someone that God is working with, and we see a progress, a progression, his mind moving and developing. So if we think about these three sections, chapter 1 to 3, chapter 4 through 37, and 38 through 42, it helps us get a deeper meaning of the purpose and the intent of the book. Uh, let us just uh, pay attention to part 1 of Job, chapter 1 and 2. You see, when we read the book of Job, we can get the sense that something is really wrong in the world. What we believed in, right and wrong, cause and effect, fairness, justice, has failed us. We want everything to mean something, to have a purpose. And as we will see, the book of Job very much does have purpose. It's not just uh, not the meaning that many people take from it, you know, of course. As we begin, that's why the Church of God is there to explain those things to people. Because again, you know, the Bible is the coded word sometimes. And uh, to decode it, you need help, outside help. Help from a higher authority, if you wish. So in any case, God has raised his church to be explaining all of those things, ins and outs, to the general public, but more, 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 but more importantly, to the church itself. So um, 
something is wrong. We will, we want everything to have some meaning, to have a purpose, and but you know the Book of Job pretty much does have purpose and meaning. It's just not the meaning that many people will take from that book. As we begin in the Book of Job, uh, we find that he is a righteous man from the land of Uz. In verse one, it is said that he was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. So he was a very wealthy man. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East, says the Bible. A righteous man is blessed, you know, by a loving God. Well, that makes total sense. Right, right. However, if when we drop down to verse 6 of chapter 1, we come to the part of the story where many people find a break with reality. Something goes terribly wrong. But as we will see, there is our reality, and there then there is God's reality. You know, Job chapter one verse six. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, "Where have you been? Where have you come from?" Satan answered to the, to the Lord, "From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth." Then the Lord said to Satan, "Have you considered my servant Job?" There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. So again, you know, God describes Job as a righteous man. Not a self-righteous man, but a righteous man. And even the accuser, Satan, answers back in verse 9. And he says, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flock and hers are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, we, we see here in verse 10, Satan mentioned the hedge around Job. Now, that's also something very interesting, brethren. So, hedge around Job. What is, it, what is so interesting? Well, obviously, that uh, obedience to God does offer us protection and blessing. Satan suggests that if he allowed, if he is allowed to create a disconnect, take away the physical cause and effect relationship, Job will curse God because the life that once made sense no longer makes sense. So Satan did just that. He took all of Job's vast physical blessings away from him. But as we will see, beginning in verse 20, Job didn't fall for it. Verse 20 and this. Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, verse 22, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Then in chapter 2, verse 3, chapter 2, verse 3, the Lord asks Satan again, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Verse 4, skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan says, threaten his very life, and he'll act like any other man. Verse 6, the Lord said to Satan, very well then, he's in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Verse 8, Then Job took a piece 
of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and I. In other words, get over with. You know, it's not it's not worth it. You know, what a <laughs> what a counsel. What a counsel, you know, in these in these uh, very difficult times for Job. In any case, we continue. Verse 10, he replied, You're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Now in all this, or in spite of all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. It is good for us to remember that Satan, brethren, knows human nature inside and out. He is the author of it. He, like Job, he is looking to turn us from God as well. Satan knows what turns our head. He knows what what uh, 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 what pushes our buttons. He knows how we think, and uh, he will use anything to us at his disposal in an attempt to create distance between us and God. But what he doesn't know is the choice we'll make when confronted with what we normally respond to with a process of rationalization in our own life. Now, you know, we get off the track when we view our calling from a physical standpoint. It is spiritual and a lot is at stake. What is missing from all of imaginative interpretations of what is going on here is what God is really doing, you know. We have, uh, we're missing the plan of God. Now, you see, Herbert Thompson said over and over and over and over and over again, it all gets back to the true trees of the Garden of Eden. Uh, you know, and the decision made here, made there, actually, in the Garden of Eden, decision made there, that day by Adam and Eve, the same decision that you and I struggle with every day of our lives, of whether or not to learn on our own understanding and to lean on our own understanding and is based on Satan's two lies. First, that we will not surely die, and secondly, that we shall be like God. Now, these two lies have disconnected us, have separated us from the eternal brethren indeed. It separated us from God because they assert these two lies that we can have a sustained life apart from God. That's why New Age is so popular today that our life does not require a relationship with God to be sustained. And that is appealing to us because from our limited perspective, we think that puts us in control. We are the master of, the, of our universe. And so the human race from that time to this has been trying to play God without any success. God's plan is to bring us back into a relationship with him God's plan is to be at one with or to reconcile a man to himself now if we keep this in mind when reading Job and in fact the whole of the Bible the things that we learn we tend to see from you know only from only human perspectives, shall we say, uh, we will see how uh, things we tend to see from only human perspective, like Job's undeserved suffering, things that loom large from our point of view, both here and in our own lives. They become quite clear and understandable when seen from a spiritual perspective. But that is hard to do, when you're in the midst of scraping the boils on your body, you know. Now we have the same situation with Moses, you know. Because Moses disobeyed God in the desert of Sinai by striking the rock instead of speaking to it to bring forth water for the, for the children of Israel. And God determined that God, uh, well, determined that Moses... Anyway, God determined that God, you know, that Moses would not see the promised land. 
he would actually see it, but that he would not enter it. And Moses has, you know, had let his uncontrolled anger get the best of him. And some see this as a tragic end to a life devoted to serving God, a punishment that doesn't fit the crime. Well, brethren, they would just reason that God is not just, you know, because while God's decree deeply hurt him, Moses himself would have not have, uh, we would not have seen this event in that way. Moses knew something about God that we do that we too quickly forget. At the end of his life, knowing full well what his end would be, Moses said to the house of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 3 and 4. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 3. I'll proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect and his ways are just. A faithful God who does not does no work up, up, upright and just is he. Uh, sorry, the, the, a faithful God who does no wrong upright and just is he. Now, these were not empty words with Moses, brethren. And they were not empty to him because he came into this conclusion after a lifetime of developing a relationship with God. In the end, he was called to be friend of God. Moses knew that this life is only a part, a stepping stone. And uh, in God's overall plan for all humankind, uh, Moses was grateful to be invited to play a part in that plan and he knew he was being molded and prepared for a greater work. Now the book of Job in the in conclusion brethren for this first installment the book of Job is a bird's eye view on that process the same process that God is engaged in with each and every one of us. It is the process of reconciliation the process of repentance, the process of self-awareness. It is not about a harsh God, an unfair God, a capricious God. It is, in a way, the story of a God that loved Job so much he wouldn't leave him where he was. God was not going, was going to, well, he was not going to go, go anywhere. He was going to Anyway, uh, the process of self-awareness is not about harsh God, it's a dear God. So the story of a God that loved Job so much that he would just uh, he was going to draw Job even near closer to him, as we will see. And uh, it's so it is, you know, all these wrong notions that are in the world, brethren, we need to overcome them and uh, stay away from them and uh, and above them.